Okay, so today we're talking about heat treating. Um, this is one of those really peculiar little bits of universe because people use language very, very differently. Um, but really there is only, there's only three primary constructs underneath the heat treating. We're gonna kind of do a video all about it as one and then go back and revisit each process. So annealing is the de-stressing of the material post-work, so post-forging or post-machining. Hardening is the actual uh, making hard of the steel, so the quench. So again, another word that gets confused in here. And then the temper is your post cycle with a low temperature that we do. Um, this is an old chisel that I made, uh, judging on the stamp that's on it, probably 15 years ago, somewhere around there. Um, I believe it to be 01, I'm not too worried, I know it's uh, oil hardening steel. It had reached a point that it needed reforging, the grind had just got too steep on it and uh, it wasn't desirable for what I wanted. So, I threw it back in the fire, reforged it. And now I'm going to uh, heat treat it. So, at the moment, I'm just going through doing some final shredding, uh, just getting everything more or less where I want it to be. Um, but through this process, I'm doing what um, I was taught was a process, a process called blue-black finishing, um, which some people will may refer to it as uh, grain packing, but that's not actually what I'm doing. Um, what I'm doing is just doing light work, bringing in my final hammer finish, um, and getting my final alignment right in the low temperatures. And as I do this, I'm not bringing it up super, super hot. I'm bringing it up to probably somewhere a shade over 1600 degrees, which for my general oil hardening steels is a good temperature for quenching. Um, I know this is my oil, so I've got my bucket of oil down here. Cover that. Uh, here's a little warning from personal experience. Make sure your water bucket is well out of the way or at least covered so that you don't have any surprising moments and drop a perfectly good piece of tool steel into a bucket of water and ruin it. So we get questions about whether you can re reforge a piece of heat treated steel. Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. Go ahead, stick it back in the fire, rework it, bring it up one time, let it come up through its critical temperature and then allow it to come down a little bit and then you can start forging easily enough. Um, should be fine. We'll let that normalize whilst we have a conversation. So, yeah, that's kind of fine. It's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but um, it'll work very well for a tool for a chisel in my um, toolkit. So, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choke this fire down and touch it. It's been running for about 30 minutes now. It's got a good, bright ambient temperature on it, so I'm not fighting any cold spots. Now I'm just gonna bring it down, see if I can get it to simmer somewhere a little over 1600. Um, I know for this steel, uh, whether it be a spring steel or 01, it's going to be perfectly happy quenching in oil at a non-magnetic state. I've got a magnet right here. Uh, I like to keep that at the edge of my uh, workstation, so if I do need to make a quick check, I can do. And you can see quite well that that is definitely magnetic. Um, so as this cools down, it's as it transitions out um, at critical temperature, it's going to stop being magnetic. As it cools back down again, it will transfer back into magnetic. These are all things that people have confusions with. Um, so when I quench this, I'm going to actually do a 
kind of a, a bit of a odd quench. I'm going to do a rear quench, which will probably be an inch and a half or so, and then allow the temper to pull through to grey, so somewhere around about 800, 1000 degrees. And then the front end, I'm going to do a quench of about two inches, and then do a body drawn temper. So it's going to draw the heat out of the body into the tip and come up to a nice uh, dark straw to bronze color, uh, which you're looking at about 250 to 325 degrees, somewhere around there. Um, so in so doing, I know that that is gonna give me a good general work, uh, general work chisel for in the shop, whether it be cutting cold steel or carving cold steel or working cold steel. Um, here's your things, okay. Normalizing. Normalizing has become like the big fan word in blade smithing. Normalizing is a type of annealing, okay? So whenever you have done with a tool steel or a high carbon steel, whenever you have completed your processes, so whether it be forging, whether it be heavy, heavy grinding or machining, it is recommended that you anneal. And annealing could be a very, very slow process to actually leave it in a softer state, or there is normalizing, which will kind of leave it at an ambient rest state. So you bring it up to critical temperature, or actually a little bit over critical, critical temperature, um, and then allow it to cool. So we're usually going about 50 to 100 degrees max above. Certain steels will specify that they do best with multiple um, anneal cycles or normalization cycles. And remember, when you read that recipe, so, you know, classic thing is the um, heat treater's guide. You know, it's basically a bunch of heat treat uh, specs for standard industrial application. And the reason I emphasize that standard industrial application is that these steels were not designed for blacksmiths for blacksmith application or for knife makers for knife uh, blade smithing application or knife making application. So in so doing, the descriptions of their heat treat is probably more likely for its heavy industrial use, whether it be punches, whether it be aerospace components, engine components, whatever it might be. So do not assume that the heat treat that they specify is going to magically be exactly what you need it to be. Um, this is like grandma's chocolate cake recipe, okay? Grandma had her particular oven, she had her particular place that she got her flour and butter and blah, 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 and the way that her oven heated and the environment and that she worked in and you know how she mixed, so on and so forth, all created that cake. When you go and make that same chocolate cake, it might not be quite as it was when grandma did it because her pinch might be a little bit bigger than yours. Her tablespoon might be a little bit more feisty than yours. You know, those kinds of things. So, so being you're possibly using a steel that is intended for aerospace application, it's got an aerospace heat treat specification, and you go and heat treat your object based upon that, and it is too soft, or it's too hard, or it's too brittle. Understand that you have to tweak that recipe to your particular palette of application. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so I could allow this to come down a little further. It'd be nice to allow it to come all the way down to room temperature, but it'll be fine. Um, I'm gonna start with the back end. I'm putting it in, we've done a video on this already, but I'm putting it in pretty much all the way, so I'm getting a good long heat. But I'm only quenching the back inch, and this will harden up the back end pretty hard, and then as the temper comes through, it will soften out a lot of that hardness, so it'll release a lot of those carbides out of their uh, structure, and it will make it tougher, okay? So even if you allow it to go all the way back to grey, it's still going to be harder and tougher than it would have been if you just left it as normalised. Generally, if you do a, a true 
um, specified slow anneal cycle, it will be softer than if you do a normalized cycle. So we have a bucket here, or a trash can, that's full of vermiculite. And we use the vermiculite for doing our kind of blacksmith um, anneal cycle. So you just bring it up to critical temperature, sling it into the vermiculite, make sure that your vermiculite is fluffed up, because if it's heavy compacted, it's not going to hold the heat as nicely and leave it overnight and often with something like a hammerhead by the next morning it's still fairly warm it'll be 100 200 degrees so you know lift it out let it cool the rest of the way um, it's coming up nicely in temperature yeah, that looks pretty good a little bit of a shadow there that should be okay yeah i have converted so here we go into the oil pop the tip in and slow figure eights until it is dark. And I want a little bit of bob to my motion. If I give it just a really hard straight line, that could create a stress line in my quench uh, and thus create a failure. And I've got a file here so I can actually show you a little bit of how hard it got, or fake hardness on it. Okay. So that's nicely cooled off. The oil on the end has not flash combusted, which means it's well below 600 degrees. And you can see there that the file is skating, but up here, it's actually biting where it's still hot. And you can see my temper colors rushing through towards the tip very quickly because there's so much thermal mass. Okay, that's fine by me because I want this to go to gray. I'm gonna flip it around using the thermal mass that's in that mid-drift I'm going to put this back in the fire but leave that back inch or so out of the main chamber just allow that front end to come up nicely in heat and then I'm going to quench that front end I'm going to scuff it watch my temperature colors travel um, I'm trying to remember who I got this that, that was um, Paul. Paul Garrett up at John C Campbell uh, showed me this little trick. I always used to use um, you know, a piece of sandpaper or um, file. File files often didn't work, but like a, yeah, a little bit of sandpaper on a on a baton or a, a hard rock um, a grinder disc. And Paul was like, "Man, just use a broken um, it's a eight, six eight inch wheel uh, from a pedestal grinder." He says, "Use that. It's great." And uh, I think then later on. I saw Asprey do the same. That front end got a little warm, but for this application, I'm not too concerned. Uh, we will get into the conversation about this a little bit, about grain growth. Uh, if you get your material too hot, you're gonna get grain growth and you kind of all kinds of different little problems, um, which may cause increased likelihood of failure in your tool so chipping generally I'm just bringing this down slow I can see see that kind of uh, gray area that's a really good show that my color uh, that my hardness has actually occurred You're talking about those spots yeah this gray zone mm -hmm. here um, yeah that's usually a good sign that I've actually hardened stuff. So just as a vague uh, visual reference. I'm letting that body temperature drop down until it's into a dull cherry. And that should give me enough thermal mass to draw that temper through. And if it gets a little feisty, I can stick it back in the oil and cool it off again. lines down those corners a little bit across that face I want this to slowly draw if I've got too much thermal mass back here so this is like a bright yellow um, it will push and it will cause the colors to stack very very close together what I'm trying to do is have just enough thermal mass, and it's gonna take practice. You'll probably screw up a few pieces on the way there. Uh, 
but you get enough thermal mass that this just stretches out nice and broad. Uh, my blue maybe reaches no further than here and the straw and the bronze reach all the way through to the tip. Uh, we might be lucky. Here's another thing to think about. The front end color on there is about 250, 225, 250 degrees. Um, the rich, rich blue, that kind of royal blue, um, dark blue, I think they refer to it as, is about 600 degrees. So we're only looking at about 400, 350, 400 degrees in temperature difference between one end and the other of the color range. I mean, sure, the gray is about 800, uh, true gray is probably closer to 1,000. So, but your, your temperature range is pretty short in, in the scheme of things, in our world anyway. Um, so, you know, be aware if you go and get a butane torch on it, heat it up, you're going to blow through those colors really, really quickly. And if you do add warmth to it, I recommend that you add it from back here rather than up at the front. That way the heat travels rather than putting a hot spot. There we go, starting to see some very light straw up at the tip. And the color that I would love to reach up to the tip is about here, that kind of bronze, golden, golden straw slash bronze color there. Can you bring it back down here because I was able to see it better. Um, Tell me what you need. Tilt it this way a bit. Don't grab it there. Right there is perfect. Right. Well, you're going to have to tell me on the colors because I can't see them now. Okay. Um, I just wanted to point out again that color that you're looking for. It is the bronze going into uh, yellow, right? Is that what you said? No, you're looking at the dark straw. Dark straw. Yeah, because your there. colors are, they're supposed to be light, kind of like yellow, light straw, dark, medium straw, dark straw, mm -hmm. bronze, bronze with purple, purple, uh, dark blue, light blue, gray. That's what they claim. Okay. And you know, sure. Still waiting on those colors. Might not get there, so I'm actually going to give it a little bit of a color bump or a heat bump. So I'll warm it back here. I'm just using that flame that comes out the front of the uh, forge to catch it. You can actually put a piece of hot steel underneath it as well to help draw that through. Um, and that's kind of a really cool technique where you actually sandwich a piece um, between two hot pieces and that will create good. Uh, spine heating on objects or you drop a, wet, uh, a drift into the eye of something if you want to have a nice soft eye region on an axe or something like that. It's coming in well. This is a slow laborious process so don't ever rush it. That bronze is about a half inch from the tip. And I'm gonna start backing away from the fire now. Because you wanna catch those colors before they run. Mm. So this is a beautiful bronze band here. That golden straw right up on the edge. I think I'm gonna freeze that one out right there. Look at the stack of those colors, they're beautiful. Mm. All right, there we go. So at this point, I want to cool the whole thing off all the way down. Now, if you had candescence still in your main shaft that you're drawing the heat out of, um, you shouldn't quench the whole thing because then you'll be hardening that section as well and you don't want to do that. So, right, a little bit of practice on this and you'll get it figured out. Uh, as I say, it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. You just throw it back into the fire, reheat it, reharden it. And I would start from the beginning, throw the back end in first, then throw the front end in. Do not be surprised by uh, a hot piece of metal that has been quenched in oil. It is probably hot. You usually don't get it down below about 250. Um, so if you at this point go ahead and grab a hold of your tool, you'll be surprised and uh, may have a nice kind of 
fried chicken situation going on. So, be aware. You actually still see the colors fairly nicely. Put a little oily at this point, but there's a nice bronze and blues and so on and so forth in there. I don't know if you can get the light to show it. It's, it's very, very subtle. Okay, so got a couple more things that I'd like to bring to note. Um, yeah, that's still pretty warm. But I would, no, it's a hot cup of coffee. Um, so if you do have a lot of thermal mass in there, go ahead, scrub it again. Make sure that you're not drawing an, a secondary temper and you'll lose the temper that you already have. Um, but in all, that's all I need to do with this tool. Um, want to talk about the uh, mythical file test. Um, if I take this now, rub it on there, as all of you can hear and probably see, it is not cutting it. Also, back here, it is cutting it, but here it is not. So this means that this piece here has basically normalized out, which is great. And then in my back end, I should have a little bit more hardness uh, than that midriff there. Yeah, it's kind of sort of touching it, but not much. Not as much as in here in the body. So that tells me that that back end has hardened a wee bit and is vaguely tough, or should be fairly tough, which is great for my impact zone. My body here is tough and fairly ductile, which means it's going to absorb that energy and transfer it through to the tip of the tool quite nicely. But my cutting edge down at the front end is nice and hard. Um, do not be tempted to cool your tool and even resting it on the anvil like this can be detrimental. Uh, you may want to just leave the whole thing in a cup of oil or go ahead, drop it into your hardy hole, let it finish cooling out the rest of the way. Um, tool steels such as O1, S7, those kinds of things, um, if you go and quench them before they've fully completed their hardening cycle, and some steels, that hardening cycle can be as long as two or three hours. So they won't actually fully finish their conversion um, for quite some time after quench. Right? So what you're saying is you don't want to stick those in water because... Yeah. Be patient. Yeah. Be patient. And, you know, if you saw the, one of the videos I did, I made a, a punch and then uh, off screen, it was almost cooled down and foolishly I went and stuck in some water and actually failed when I was doing a demo with it later. Okay, so, did the file test, awesome, it skates, blah, blah, blah. I have another file over here, same, got them from the same big box store. They're both Nichols files, this is a mill bastard, um, and this one's, Actually, neither of them. Yeah, it is a nickel. Um, anyway, if you look at this up here, I am actually filing the steel. The sound is different. It's not a lot, but it is actually cutting the steel. So, this is the problem with the file test. I know from actual testing, this one's about 60 Rockwell C. Uh, it's been in the workshop a lot. It's been used for a lot of heat treating. This one here is over 65. Um, so a lot of the steels that we use for heat treating, uh, especially in the blacksmith shop, and you know, we're not using fancy, fancy steels and heat treating them in a heat treat oven. We're just doing them in the forge. They're not going to achieve hardnesses that are harder than that file. Right? So you go and scrub it with the file, you're like, oh man, it didn't harden. Okay, no, you, what's actually happening is that you have in, insufficient or inappropriate feedback, so you don't know what you actually have. Basically, my 5116, my 4140 will never get that hard. My 01 might, my S7 might, but only just. And that's without temper come down pretty well okay 
Um, I know this is a hellaciously long video. Uh, sorry about that. Um, last little things, I'm just going to do a grind on this and then do a uh, bar cut test with it uh, just to show it did what it did. Also, ooh, before we go away on the files conversation, this is a set of files I've had forever and they've probably worn a little bit, uh, but here they're actually graded. So this one is uh, 55 Rockwell C, HRC. Um, if I give this a rub back here, it's almost cutting, but here, absolutely not cutting. Back end, absolutely not cutting. Okay, so let's go up to 60. Absolutely cutting there. It's a little warm still. It's cutting here, but not as easily as it is in that body area. Half, halfway down my quench here, it stopped biting. So bites and about there, it stops biting. This is where my blue, light blue uh, area was. So down in that tip, absolutely not cutting. And then this one is a 65, if you can vaguely see the numbers on that. And let's have a feel down here. It's almost cutting there. But down here in the very, very tip, it isn't doing jack. Okay. So how hard did you say that one file was that was cutting? It must be... It's over 65. It's over 65, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. so. down here, it's still actually cutting down here. Mm -hmm. You can see that cutting on that edge. Right. Right? So this one would be great for if you're resharpening a, a saw or something like that, where you've actually got 60 rock C plus on that saw edge. Um, but ain't no good if you're trying to figure out whether your knife steel's hardened or not. Right, so I guess that's the moral of the story is the file test doesn't really tell you anything unless you know how hard your files are. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm just going to do a wee grind on this. Remember, keep your steel cool as you grind it because if you get those rainbow colors in there, you have blown out your temper and you've softened your steel again, right? I've seen that happen enough. <laughs> Also, you can get you can get a zone which is called decarb. If you heat and heat and heat and heat your steel, you'll actually burn out the carbon in the steel. So you might get twenty thou, fifty thou, you know, somewhere around there. Usually, kind of sub sixteenth of an inch um, amount of damage to the steel. So make sure you've ground that off uh, to make sure that you're entering into the body of the steel where the carbon is good. <laughs> I usually count to about three. Go back into the water. Uh, I'm running an old uh, 80 grit ceramic, something like that. Um, this is a blacksmith tool, thus it does not need to shave. Uh, have a fairly thick geometry to that. I don't know what that is, probably 20 degrees-ish. I got an angle measure on the other side, but in that bothered. But 20 degrees, kind of apple seed. It's nice and chunky on that tip. Um, let me grab a piece of mild steel from down here. Hopefully something that hasn't been quenched. But that's all okay. So. And a good way to test whether you've actually heat treated your tool is I like to try and carve a piece of cold steel with it. So that'll work. Come in on that corner. And you can see that, that is just peeling out that material very, very nicely. Oh, may as well break it all the way out. Try not to pop Jess in the eye. 
go. And then if you look at that cutting edge again, still no damage to it. Good heat treat, good and solid. I would happily use that tool for the next 15 years and do absolutely nothing to it as well. <laughs> so, uh, I don't know where that little piece went. Disappeared somewhere on the floor. Um, but, that is heat treating in a nutshell. Do a good anneal normalization. Make sure that you have de-stressed the material having gone through its forging processes or stock removal processes. And especially the forging, if you're doing a lot of high temperature forging because it can agglomate the grain structure and make it very coarse. We'll do some brake tests later and kind of discuss that more. Um, then do a good quench in the correct quench medium. And there's a very ambiguous statement right there. Whole because <laughs> whole nother conversation. But essentially, just because people say it's air hardening doesn't mean it's strictly air hardening. And steels such as um, S7 are actually air hardening or oil hardening. Um, if you find that your steel doesn't harden well enough in the quench medium for your application that you have used, change your quench medium. And that might mean simply changing the weight of the oil. So, you know, whether you're using a heavy engine oil or you're using a light cooking oil or you're using a synthetic quench medium, um, these are all kind of changing how quick you're cooling that uh, material and so how much conversion you're getting into those carbides and basically entrapping that carbon construct. Um, I, that oil over there is kind of a mix of uh, old Chevy pickup truck engine oil and canola oil. I won't lie to you, it's pretty slow. Uh, but it makes great tools <laughs> because it is slow and I'm not overstressing the material. Um, some of the best hammers that I have were quenched in that oil and the reason that they're so good is they're not chippy. They're tough, tough, tough. Where uh, others that I've tested uh, quenching into parks um, are actually too hard even though I did the same temper and this is kind of a weird thing somebody way above my pay grade can explain all these conversations but um, essentially you can either really really harden it or not so harden it and then you temper um, but once you've got the hardness done go into your temper tempers are very much determinant upon your final application uh, I remember in the old um, textbooks that we used to have when I was at Smith and College, were, they would talk about, oh, you know, a razor blade is tempered at light straw, and a spring is tempered at 600 degrees. What steel are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense. If, it, if it's without con context, you don't have information. It's just an ambiguous statement out in the universe. Um, you know, likewise, quench it between two aluminum plates. I don't know what I'm quenching between the two aluminum plates. So, you know, that might not actually produce an appropriate quench or quench it in water, quench it in oil. These things are all very determinant upon the steel uh, cross section and final application of your tool in this regard. I hope that was suitably confusing and opened up far more questions than answers and hopefully the next series of videos will help um, postulate I suppose I'm not going to say answer because I um, as I say I, that's way above my pay grade but uh, hopefully help you understand what you're trying to do with your tool steel and what you're trying to actually achieve out of it all right awesome um, on to the next one, I reckon. Thank you.